Okay, it looks like the joins have leveled off a little bit. Um, once again, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Puget Sound Regional Council's um, virtual public meeting for our draft uh, regional transportation plan. Uh, we'll be holding three of these webinars in the next week. Uh, and so if it also will be recording this and posting it on our website, if you have to, to leave or would like to uh, revisit some of the material. Um, I'm Ben Bakenta. I'm the Director of Regional Planning at PSRC. And so just a couple of um, points of information. Um, so participants are automatically muted for this webinar. Um, if you have questions, and we have um, a time reserved at the end of the webinar for a Q&A session, um, use the Q&A function, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll be reading out those questions um, for staff that, who are here with us from PSRC to answer questions. Uh, we'll be launching a couple of polls, um, just fun kind of informational polls during the webinar. And so to participate in that poll, um, the uh, dialog box will launch in the main meeting screen and select the answers and submit. Um, if you don't have the latest version of Zoom, you may have some problems with that. We apologize, but um, there's nothing we can do on our end um, on that score. So with that information, let me introduce Kelly McGurdy. She's the Director of Transportation at the Puget Sound Regional Council. Um, she will be providing a presentation about um, PSRC, the draft regional transportation plan, um, what we've heard so far in outreach that we've conducted over the last two years as we've developed the plan. She'll also highlight plan performance, and then we'll have that public comment period. Um, or rather, she'll provide information about the public comment period and the next steps that our board will be taking to um, finalize the plan this spring. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kelly. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Ben noted, I'm Kelly McGurdy. I'm the Director of Transportation Planning here at PSRC. We're uh, really excited to be here with you this morning. And I'm just gonna share a little bit about who we are. So Puget Sound Regional Council, for those of you who don't know, we do long range regional planning. Uh, we encompass the four counties of King, Kitsap, Pierce, and Snohomish counties. And as you can see from this slide, in terms of long range planning, we focus on, and I apologize for the dog barking in the background. Of course, she started to do it just right then. We do uh, planning around growth. We do planning around economic development, and we do planning around transportation. As part of that, we also have responsibility for distributing some federal transportation dollars. We conduct a competitive process for those dollars every few years. And we, we've continued to see upward movement of, of how much of those dollars we expend. Um, there are very specific programs, of course, being federal dollars, but the types of investments that we've been able to fund cover all aspects of our transportation system from sidewalks to bike lanes, transit, freight, roadway improvements, signals, local roundabouts, um, uh, um, uh, highway improvements, roadway improvements, it's a, a variety of different types of projects that we're able to fund. Um, one of our um, primary elements is also a lot of um, data collection and forecasting. We ha have a lot of very comprehensive uh, modeling tools to help support all of that planning that we do. And perhaps most importantly, we're a table where folks around the region can come together and talk about these issues and plan for the future. We uh, encompass a, a lot of different member jurisdictions. I think we have over 100, uh, 100 member organizations now from all of the cities in those four counties I mentioned, the ports, all of our transit agencies, the tribal governments, as well as variety of state agencies. So we're gonna start with our very first poll uh, and just simply ask you where in the region uh, do you live? And so Casey, I'll go ahead and ask you to start that poll. Okay, we've had about 92% participation. Great, let's go ahead if we can show those results. Okay. Perfect. So that's a pretty good um, cross representation across our four counties and across the region. So that's fantastic. Looks like uh, for those of you who maybe can't see that screen, 38% of our participants this morning are from King County, 17% from Kitsap County, 13% from Pierce County, 29% from Snohomish County, and then 4% from other, which could be one of our cities that's in both counties or perhaps um, someone from outside of our, our region. 
So thank you for that. So why do we do what we do? Um, as I'm sure you are all aware, we have been a, a growing region and we continue to grow. And as you can see from the chart on this screen, we are expected to add 1.6 million more people by 2050 and 1.1 million more jobs. So we need to, uh, all of the, the, uh, the areas I mentioned in terms of growth, transportation and the economy, our role is to help plan for that future and to accommodate both the people who live here and work here today, as well as those people and jobs that are coming into the future. This slide represents kind of the, the foundations of PSRC. At the top of the slide, you can see uh, Vision 2050. Vision is our overarching policy framework. The, this is where we have the policies and the goals and the actions that guide all of the work that we do, including how we grow, what we want our transportation system look, to look like, what are some of the, the key premises around the economy, around the environment, and several other uh, aspects of, our, of, our, of our, our total region. And then underneath that, the regional transportation plan and the regional economic strategy are more detailed functional plans that, that build from Vision 2050. And we're here today, of course, to talk about the Regional Transportation Plan, which, as we've noted, is out for public comment right now. And I'm this morning going to walk through some of the information that's in that plan, share with you where you can find some materials on our website so that you can learn more about the plan and comment, and then just field some, some questions and answers. So this is a, a plan for the transportation system out to 2050. So we are guided by um, several boards of decision makers here at PSRC from uh, elected officials from our member jurisdictions, as well as representatives from the business uh, and, uh, and community groups. And when we started the development of this particular transportation plan, we wanted to uh, have some foundational information on, on where do we want to go with this? What are our objectives? And it really came down to two. One is to recognize that while we are a growing region and we know we have to plan out to 2050, we also have real challenges with the system today. And so we wanted to dig in and address some of those current and future needs. As well, um, uh, I'll, just, I'll just use an example. So let's say the uh, city of Kent, for example, the city of Kent will do their own local planning. Each jurisdiction has comprehensive plans and they are all working to update those with the 2024 uh, in, uh, approval date. And so our regional transportation plan, we recognize there's an opportunity for us to help support that local planning and provide more detailed data and analysis. In addition, as I mentioned earlier, we are planning for a lot more people and a lot more jobs in the region out to 2050. So while we wanna plan for and improve the system that we have today and accommodate those needs, we also have an opportunity to think, think a little bit bigger about what are some of the larger uh, and longer term needs that we need to be addressing and how can we get in front of those. And we'll certainly would like to hear your feedback on that. Is that uh, expansion of high speed rail? Is that expansion and, and bringing in new passenger only ferry routes? We know there's a lot of demand for our airports. Is that a new or expanded airport? Or it could be any number of things that we have an opportunity to think about now and start the planning for the future. Another thing that we talked about with our boards is, is these key policy focus areas. I mentioned Vision 2050 is our overarching framework and policy document. And so building from all of the work from Vision, which was adopted in October of 2020, we thought for the Regional Transportation Plan, these are the six things, in addition to uh, acknowledging and addressing the full system, these were the six things that rose to the top of what we really wanted to focus in on a little bit more. Um, as I'll share with you in a moment, we are expecting a pretty significant expansion of our transit system, but we recognize it's not just enough to have that transit system, we also need to make sure that people can access that system, and not just from uh, driving to a park and ride, for example, but through sidewalk improvements, bicycle lane, from uh, bus connection, connections to rails is just an example. Safety continues to be a really critical issue uh, around the region for a transportation system. And as we've learned, and I'll share with some of the outreach that we've already done, safety isn't just about um, crashes, for example, but it's also about personal safety. Uh, equity, the Puget Sound Regional Council is really doing um, a number of things to try to advance equity throughout the region, as well as to advance equity within our own work program. And as you'll see in some coming slides, 
Equity is also woven throughout the transportation plan to make sure that uh, all of our, our residents have uh, the same opportunities um, uh, for a, a safe and multimodal transportation system. Climate, of course, continues to be a big area of focus for, for our work. And I'll share with you some information about um, the plan and how, how this plan addresses meeting future climate goals. And then again, as I, as I noted, all, we have 100 plus uh, member jurisdictions. We have real local needs throughout the region today, addressing some of those local agency needs. But at the same time, as I mentioned, thinking about the future and having some forward thinking planning start to occur. So getting a little bit more detailed, um, this slide represents some of the work that we did as we started to develop this plan. So as I mentioned, we have a very robust um, data and analysis department here at PSRC. But a few years ago, we decided let's, let's try to gather as much information on the current transportation system as possible so that we have that as a foundation, and then we all can also start to look into the future. So some of the work that we did, um, and, and one caveat and, and nuance I'd like to share with you is that we are a four county region. That's a lot of um, people, a lot of the transportation system, but we can't track every facility. So for example, the local road in front of your street, we don't have the information or the capacity to track that, but we do have the information and the capacity to track more um, uh, larger arterials and highways. And so the data that we're talking about is really from that scale, from those facilities that are carrying more of the, the um, uh, vehicle and people movement throughout the region. So for the first time, we have a sidewalk inventory on those arterials and highways. We have a bicycle lane inventory. We collected information on all of the signals on those facilities. We have information on transportation demand management programs. And so for, the, uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with that term, if you work for a uh, larger employer, for example, who might provide bus passes, that's an example of a TDM program. And we've tried to track information on where those are available. So there's a lot of really detailed information on the system that we've provided. We've built a visualization tool, which can be found on our website. And I just realized, Ben, I think we need to update that uh, web link, which we will do shortly after this webinar. But the, um, the screenshot in front of you is an example of how that data can actually be used for um, both for us at the regional scale to do our planning, but also for local jurisdictions to do their planning. So for example, what you see in front of you right now is where the pedestrian and bicycle facilities are currently located, where there are gaps, and then where they are um, uh, connecting to or where there's a gap to transit stops. So that could be so, an example of some really valuable on the ground information about where some of those needs might be. So I mentioned we have already done a lot of outreach. So the plan, the draft plan is out for public comment right now, but leading up to the draft plan development, we did a lot of outreach. We started with a representative public survey and we received over about 1900 responses from that. From that online survey, we did some follow-up uh, interviews. I believe we had over 20 interviews with um, individuals uh, with, from four different languages. We've reached out to youth groups within each of our four counties and, and heard from over 50 um, youth. We also took that same representative survey and put it on our website for a broader outreach. And I believe that number was around 1400 respondents to that survey. Um, and we've continued to do, since obviously since we're in the pandemic, we haven't done anything in person, but we've gotten really great engagement uh, going to where people are, we've, we've also, through what we call our coordinated mobility plan, there's been a lot of outreach to um, folks that might, might need um, more specialized transportation services. So for example, seniors, people with disabilities, we've, we've gone to their um, uh, meetings and, or, and um, um, provided some stakeholder outreach to, to those individuals as well. So we've learned a lot leading into the plan and I'll share with you a little bit of what we've heard. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of bullets on this slide. I won't read all of them, but I'll give you kind of the, the general flavor. And there have certainly been, with all of the outreach we've done to date, there have been consistent themes in terms of what we're hearing. And the questions that we've asked, we're really getting about personal transportation needs, personal needs of the transportation system. What are you having a challenge with today? What would you like to see in the future? And given that we are um, in an unusual uh, environment right now with the pandemic, we've also asked, 
you know, their thoughts into the future about taking transit in the future, taking more transit, or what might be some barriers to that. So um, just to, maybe I'll just zoom in on a, a few key elements of what we've heard. Folks are interested in just having reliability in their, in their travel. So well-maintained roads and highways, transit service that is well-connected, that allows them to get from where they're living to where they need to go, whether that's work or um, stores or recreation. Definitely interest in completing our bicycle and pedestrian facility network. In terms of what might it uh, require to encourage people to use transit more, no surprise, um, shorter trip times, easier to access the transit system, as well as having extended service, particularly for those, and on the right side of this slide, you can see um, some responses related to folks who do require some special transportation services, that it's beyond just the commute period. It's, it's in the evenings, it's on the weekend. And particularly for those who have special mobility needs, um, things like having curb ramps in the sidewalks, um, providing um, better services so they can access healthcare. So we've received a lot of really good information. Again, as we do more and more outreach, we continue to see some of these themes really rise to the top about the, the needs of, of folks. So we are continuing to do outreach. Um, we've just completed some focus groups with some underrepresented communities. We plan on reaching out to our business community. We're continuing to go to any organization that would like to hear this presentation. And as I mentioned, I'm gonna share with you in a moment, the draft plan public comment period. Um, and all of the comments and the feedback um, we provide, we will provide to our board for their consideration. So I'm going to now share just some just some highlights of what's in the plan, and and again I'll walk uh, walk you through where on our website you can find this information. We are planning out to 2050, so that is almost 30 years into the future. It is a 300 billion dollar plan. That is a very big number, but it is actually well in line with previous plans that we've done. And we do update our regional transportation plan every four years. So this is not something that we do. It sits on a shelf for a decade. We continue to evolve it and update it as needed every four years. Um, maintenance and preservation of the existing system is a key priority and has been for, for many years. And with this plan, again, over half of the plan is devoted to maintaining and operating the existing system. For the balance of the um, investments in the plan, 70% of those system improvements are for investments in local and regional transit. You can see from the bottom of this slide, that means by 2050, we expect to have 36 bus rapid transit line routes, 10 passenger only ferry routes, and 116 miles of light rail with over 80 stations. That's in addition to the um, expansion of local bus services as well, and put those bus services feeding in. It also includes our bicycle and pedestrian investments, and it does include other multimodal investments and roadway improvements that help support all of this system because we, one of the um, messages for, for this plan is that this is one integrated system. I don't think an individual user cares so much who's operating what, just that if they need to use multiple modes, that it is one seamless and integrated trans transportation system. And in terms of the finance, we also have a financial strategy of our plan. $300 billion is a lot of money, but what we do is we identify all of the revenues that are currently available today, and we forecast them into the future. And then in terms of the investments that the, the region thinks are necessary, what is that gap? And this plan actually has a little bit of a lower gap than we've had in the past. 84% of the plan we believe can be funded with those current law revenues. And in terms of the 16%, we have a financial strategy. The region has a history of uh, finding new revenue sources to help with this. For example, I'm sure you're all aware of things like um, uh, um, local tax levies, local transit levies, the, the state transportation packages. All of those are woven in. We look at the history, we look at the trends, and that 16% of the plan, we do think we have a financial strategy that can help to pay for that. So this is a screenshot of the future high capacity transit network. And again, I apologize for those of you who might not be able to see this very well, but this represents, a, and we don't have our um, current transit network, but this is showing the much expanded high capacity transit route. And it's also showing, and you'll be able to see if you review the plan, 
that where the high capacity transit network is uh, planned to be extended is where we expect people to be. This is where the growth out to 2050 is expected to occur. And for the most part, I think there's one outlier. The transit service is attempting to meet the needs of where we think that growth is going to occur. So now I'm just going to give a couple of highlights about the plan performance. And the slide in front of you is just a, a, us trying to explain that we have a lot of different performance metrics. And with a four county region and so many different areas, we try to um, provide those performance metrics in a usable way. So we will certainly talk about performance at the regional scale. We can talk about performance at the county scale. We can also look at uh, other types of geography geographies. And I mentioned equity is um, woven throughout the plan. And one of the ways that it is woven, in addition to a, a full regional equity analysis, which is a, an appendix of the plan, is looking at the performance metrics. And the list here is what we're calling uh, equity focus areas. And so we look at places around the region that have higher percentages of certain population groups. So for example, higher populations of people of color, people with low incomes, youth, older adults, people with limited proficiency and people with disabilities. And so there will be some of the metrics where there are distinctions where we can report, again, not just at the regional scale, not just at the county or sub-regional scale, but also for some of these equity focus groups. So just some highlights of what you can see from plan performance. Um, with that expanded transit network, Transit boardings are forecasted to more than triple by 2050. We also expect, as we mentioned, access to transit is an important component of the plan. We do expect almost 60% of households to be able to live within a half a mile of that high capacity transit service. And this is an example, the chart is showing different, re, uh, different geographies around the region. So for example, our metropolitan cities, cities that have high capacity transit, are urban unincorporated as well as the rural area. This, is a, this slide is, is um, sharing that the average person by 2050, we expect to be able to walk or bike 21% uh, more than today. And the chart is showing, this is an example of how we can show a metric for uh, regional performance and then people of color and people of lower income. And as you can see for all three, um, geographic looks, there is an increase in walking or biking. This one I always trip up over, so bear with me. Uh, as you all know, we are, we are a uh, busy reason. We have a we have vibrant economy and which we also have congestion. So today the average household spends an additional 62 hours a year traveling due to congestion, but with the investments in the plan, with the focused growth and with the expansion of high capacity transit and multimodal investments, we believe with this plan that the, by 2050, the average household is forecasted to spend less amount in traffic. So a 15% reduction uh, of congestion by average household over the base year. An additional performance metric relates to how much people have to drive. So today, the average household drives uh, almost 16,000 miles per year. And again, with the, with the policies and investments in the plan, the average household is forecast to drive about 23% less than today. And again, you can see from the chart, an example of the performance metrics uh, at different scales. This slide has to do with our climate goals. So we know that um, climate is a key policy focus area and PSRC has had what we call our four part greenhouse gas strategy. So there are a lot of different sources of emissions in the region. PSRC, we, we focus on transportation. So when we talk about greenhouse gas emissions, it is really from uh, the transportation, um, the, tra the on-road transportation system, so essentially vehicles, but that is influenced by land use, so our, our regional growth strategy and the policies in Vision 2050. It is influenced by the transportation choices that we provide in the plan, transit, bicycle, pedestrian, um, 
high, uh, high occupancy vehicles. It is also influenced by the pricing of the system. So as you know, we currently have a few tolled facilities in the region today. We also, everyone pays for gasoline at the pump. And then lastly, we know that in order to really meet our climate goals into the future, we do have to transition to a zero emission transportation future. So this chart is showing, and there's information in the plan that says with each of those steps, each of them is important. We can go so far with um, providing focused growth. Again, rem reminding folks that we have 1.6 million more people coming to the region and 1.1 million more jobs. But with focusing growth, with that extensive expansion of high capacity transit and other multimodal investments, with changes to our financial strategy, we can, we can achieve reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. But to truly meet our climate goals, we also then need to look to technology and decarbonizing our transportation system. There's a lot of momentum on that. There's, as I'm sure you all have seen in the, in the news and seen from state action, there is a lot of momentum to transition to electric or other alternative fueled vehicles. And we believe that with, uh, it'll take action, it'll take aggressive action and commitment, but we do believe that, that as a region, we can get there by 2050. So um, time for another quick poll. Uh, and we're gonna ask you, we have, we've provided a, a list of, of um, transportation improvements from improved transit to improved deliveries. And so we're asking you, to, if you would, to identify your top three priorities. So Casey, go ahead and start the poll. Okay, we've got about 90% have participated. All right, well, let's go ahead and see those results. Perfect, so I will just, I, I think you all can see this as well, but I'll go, if anyone happens to be on their phone, I will go ahead and read them out. Um, it looks like the top priority is reliable, well-connected transit. Then it looks like we have a tie between expanded transit and completing the network for bicyclists and pedestrians, followed by also a tie between high-speed rail and reliable, well-maintained roads and highways, widespread electric vehicle charging stations, as well as more direct and faster ferry options. So thank you so much for completing that poll. So that was a um, very high level and very quick overview of the regional transportation plan, the draft plan. But now I'm gonna share with you where you can go to learn more. So we do have an online open house and we'll be conducting three of these public webinars. And this is the, the website where you can find more information on the plan. And I'm just gonna share a few screenshots of what this looks like. So this is, our, this is the landing page. And the, from the main body of the text, you'll be able to find information on those webinars. We also have short videos uh, related to specific plan elements, and I'll walk through those, but you can either click on them individually, or you can um, the view all the topics will take you to that page. On the right-hand side is where you'll be able to find the draft plan document by chapter, full plan. We also have appendices. This screen is an example of what you'll see. It's um, on the on the right hand side is just a quick snapshot of all of the videos and then the main page is a zoomed in look. This is where you'll be able to click on uh, the, the short videos that describe what's going on in the plan. For example, the ones that you can see on your screen, system performance, equity and transit. We also have, I think we have 12 total videos. And then this is just an uh, example of what the page looks like. If you happen to click on the equity button, it'll take you to this page where there's the short video um, where staff will provide information on uh, what you'll expect to see in the draft plan related to equity. Underneath the video, you can go directly to uh, information on that topic. In this case, there's an appendix, our regional equity analysis, as well as the portion of chapter two where we talk about equity. 
And then also, again, on the right hand side of the screen, you'll be able to um, download or view the full plan. You can also look at the plan by chapter uh, and you can also see our appendices. But then also on this page, you'll see um, and variety of places throughout this website. And in this case, it's below each video. You'll you'll see our comment form. So you, you are able to uh, comment directly on this site through this form. And I believe I have a little bit more information about other, other opportunities to comment. So the draft plan is out for public comment through the end of February. We, we welcome and encourage your feedback and we'll be working with our boards through May. We, the plan is scheduled to be adopted in May. And as I mentioned, this is uh, something that we uh, evaluate and update on a regular basis. So with that, I uh, believe I will share the, um, the final bit of information about how other ways that you can comment outside of our website at the end of the session this morning. But with that, I will turn it over back to Ben. And we have a slew of PSRC staff that are experts in various elements. So we'll try to field your questions as best we can. Thank you. Great, thanks Kelly. And so some questions are rolling into the Q&A. Thank you for those who, is, who have submitted so far and please continue doing so. We have plenty of time to answer questions or provide more information. And so the first question I see Kelly is, um, when establishing the plan, did we look at where people live and work to determine where to invest? Uh, we have high populations with lower incomes outside King County, but people drive to King County to work. So how do we weight the needs of outer counties when planning? That is that is a really fantastic question. And I will, it's also a big question. So I will do my best, but I will also call on my, my partners, both Ben, as well as uh, Craig Hellman, who's our director of data. I might call on you to help me if I fumble this question. So first and foremost, I think we, we absolutely do build the plan and build our analysis around what we know about where people are living and working today, where we expect growth to occur and what the, the needs are of those people. So we have a very robust um, analysis of current conditions and forecast conditions and try to identify where some of those needs are, where the equity analysis, for example, and some of the metrics that I shared with you can identify where um, things appear to be imbalanced, for example, whether it's by um, equity focus groups, whether it's by parts of the, the area, so that those metrics will allow decision makers to see where the needs really are and where things might, um, where inequities might be occurring. So that's one part of my, my response. The other part is just to acknowledge that PSRC is not um, uh, promoting or suggesting um, specific project investments. We do have larger policies, for example, related to expansion of high capacity transit, uh, expansion of that, of that accessibility, but we rely on our member jurisdictions. They go through very detailed planning processes through their comprehensive plans to identify individual specific project investments. Our role is to identify where those needs are, where we think attention needs to happen, uh, and then we have that regional dialogue. So that's my first attempt at answering that. It was a really great question, but Ben or Craig, I would ask if there's anything from your perspective that you would wanna add. Craig, why don't you take it away? The modeling is interesting of how this is done. I was gonna say, I thought Kelly did a great job answering it. Um, I guess the only thing I would add is we build our models and tools for our entire region. So the travel behavior between city to city, region to region, all that information is included as part of kind of the decision making and planning around these projects. And I would say your example of the Pierce County to King County commutes um, being one where you can actually see a lot of the investments, say our high capacity transit investments connecting, say, Tacoma and Pierce County into King County. Um, that planning is happening as it connects and serves those markets for where people in Pierce County live and where they work. So. Great, thank you, Craig. Another related question is um, how many homes must be built within a half mile of high capacity transit to achieve that 59% that we, we, we have in the presentation and, and that we um, analyzed in the plan. And I'll begin with um, the land use assumptions that we use um, in de developing and analyzing the transportation plan come from Vision 2050. And those come from some policies in the regional growth strategy that talk about the distribution of growth around the region to different types of places. And Vision 2050 had a 
strong emphasis on concentrating growth around high capacity transit. Um, that's not only in the largest cities that have designated regional growth centers, but also in other types of cities that have planned high capacity transit investment. And so to define high capacity transit, we included commuter rail, light rail, streetcars, fast ferries, and bus rapid transit. So as if you can think back to that slide, I think it was slide number 16 that showed the extent of the regional transit network in 2050, what we did to cut to look at or to develop that 59% number was we looked at the distribution of growth in that growth strategy relative to proximity to the high capacity transit. So, um, and in terms of um, looking, I did a quick back of the napkin um, calculation in terms of our regional housing strategy that we're developing right now projects that Envision 2050 as well project that we need over 800,000 new housing units um, in the region to accommodate our anticipated growth. And if you were to take um, the, we, Vision 2050 also has a goal that 65% of new ho housing units uh, new, of population would be located within close proximity to high capacity transit. And for that, we define as either a half mile or a quarter mile, depending on the type of high capacity transit. So with that back of the napkin, it's a roughly 430, 450 housing units we would anticipate would need to be built in proximity to high capacity transit. So no, no easy task, um, but um, that is a, an assumption that our current plan is built on. I'll, I'll just conclude by saying um, that we will be we, we will be be relying to on the local planning efforts that are coming up as part of. Um, updating of local comprehensive plans to really fine tune our analysis in coming years to see exactly what local jurisdictions are planning for, what sort of densities they're allowing, um, where they're at the local level focusing growth, and that will inform future iterations of the regional transportation plan as well. We have to update the plan, as Kelly mentioned, every four years by federal law, so we'll adjust, um, but those are our, our rough assumptions at this point. So hopefully that answered the question. Um, moving on to another question, Kelly. Um, this had, there, there are a couple that have to do with bus rapid transit and about the assumptions of HOV lanes on freeways and conversion of those HOV lanes to either uh, to serve transit or to um, really make sure that transit is effective. And so maybe you can talk a bit about BRT and HOV lanes and what assumptions we have in the plan. Sure, um, and I, I, I have to confess, we have a, it's a very large plan with a, a, a number of investments in a large project that I don't have them all at my fingertips, but we do have both an appendix that lists all of the investments as well as a web map showing them. I'll start, but then I'll also call on uh, Gil Cerise, who's our program manager and who really leads our transit work. And, and Gil, feel free to, to add anything. So first and foremost, the plan definitely includes the completion of the HOV system. There's a number of projects that complete both the, the core, core HOV network on the highways, but there's also some investments related to business access transit lanes on arterials. And then there are a swath of projects, particularly for state, state highways that converts or adds a new HOV lane that will ultimately be converted to an express toll lane, particularly for example, the, the uh, I-405 bus rapid transit um, expansion. So there are a number of strategically located um, expansions for specifically for that purpose. Then there's also for a lot of the bus rapid transit routes, um, many of them might be on arterials. So it's a little bit of a different situation and the, the transit agencies are certainly planning for, if not the full route, having bus access transit lanes, but there could be um, spot locations where those types of investments will have as well as other um, transit reliability improvements, whether that's, for example, queue jumps at intersections or other types of improvements. So all told, the, the state and the transit agencies are certainly looking for those types of investments to make those routes more effective. And Gil, what, anything to add? Actually, I don't think I have anything to add. I thought you did a really good, great job. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Kelly and Gil. Um, so on the topic of equity, there's a question about what we mean by equity. And the question is, when we spoke of equity, was the focus on racial equity? If not, if not, what other types of equity are we referring to? Um, maybe Jean could help us out with, with an answer to that question. 
Sure. Um, sorry, it took a while to unmute myself. <laughs> So yeah, we definitely uh, apply the racial equity lens to the RTP and the equity analysis, which is a standalone um, an analysis document and appendix of the RTP. But um, this time we also added new equity um, focus populations as Kelly mentioned. So we looked at the areas with high concentrations of youth, older adults. So we also thought um, also included um, the areas with high concentrations of um, people with low incomes and people um, who speak um, languages other than English. So compared to the 2018 um, equity analysis and the RTP, we expanded our um, scope um, to look at other um, areas um, and the marginalized um, communities in our region. But um, our focus um, areas are more prioritized and focus areas are definitely um, the areas with high concentrations of people of color and um, people with low incomes. Does that answer your questions? Anything to add, Ben? No, thank you, June, that's terrific. And so um, if people would like more information about that, about how those areas are defined and how we analyze them, there are two, there, there are two appendices that have quite a lot of discussion of those equity focus areas. There's Appendix E, which is the equity analysis. And there's also, I forget the, the, the letter gene, but there's an appendix um, uh, that has the coordinated mobility plan. There's, there's an extensive discussion of these different population groups um, and distribution within the region. So you can get a lot of information on our website. There was a question as well about, um, so related to the appendices, um, and this is something, um, well, it's in, the question is, are the, well, one, are the appendices to the plan available online? Yes, they are. If you look in the right-hand column on the Engage page, there's there are some buttons that you can drop down. Kelly looks like she's pulling it back up. Um, there's, a, there's a folder there. If, um, that's not a live view. That's a slide. But if you were to click on that, it would drop down a, all of the appendices. So they're right there under the plan. Um, and then the question also goes on to ask, it doesn't look like the active transportation plan is an appendix this time. Um, it was in the 2018, 2018 plan. And so the question is about the level of detail for the act, for active tra transportation versus the 2018 plan. And just um, if we could explain why it's not an appendix this time. Sure, and I don't believe Sarah has joined us this morning, but we, we worked with our Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee on that. We felt like uh, in the 2018 plan, we certainly talked about in the plan bicycle and pedestrian investments, but then we had an appendix that had a lot of information, a lot of background, and we called that the active transportation plan. We thought it, it needed to be more integrated as one part of the overall system. And so what we tried to do is there's certainly an appendix on, um, I think it's our system inventory that spends a lot of time talking about the bicycle and, uh, bicycle and pedestrian facilities. But we wanted to more kind of mainstream that in the plan document itself. So there are there is a section of the plan that specifically talks about um, bicycle and pedestrian and active transportation. It talks about what we know of the system today, um, where there are gaps, where there is opportunities. It spends a lot of time really talking about uh, access to transit, for example, since that's one of the focus areas. And it's woven more completely throughout the plan document. As again, um, I think we we showed. Maybe I'll if you'll bear with me, I'll move my, there we go, change the slide. So you can see on this right-hand side, I'm calling it a fidget spinner. I should probably stop calling it, but we wanted to make the point that this is one integrated seamless system. These things aren't other. Bicycle and pedestrian isn't other from transit, which isn't other from roadways. And so that was really the approach we took to try to make the plan document itself really acknowledge how all of the elements work together. And so that's why we didn't put the active transportation plan kind of in an appendix, but we really rove it in. And again, it's it's within the document itself, it's within our visualization tool with the data, and it's also within our plan performance metrics and system inventory. Thanks, Kelly. Um, there's a great question here, and this is probably for Craig. Um, and the question is, only during the recession or a pandemic with significant work from home policies has regional traffic ever decreased? How does PSRC determine such a decrease in commute times and miles traveled? Um, and are work from home policies going to be required as part of the plan or CTR program mandates? So I can start and then other people can add in. I'd probably say all of the above. I think a big part of um, that decrease that you see in the amount of miles people are traveling per person per day, as well as changes in um, congestion, 
connect to one, a lot of land use choices that have been made. So a lot more development and density, people living closer to where they work. And so they're traveling um, less um, in terms of that average trip length. We see trip lengths for work trips declining in 2050 compared to today. There's a lot of investment in high capacity transit next people to those employment centers. So that's definitely one part of it. Um, there's also a part of a bit strategic expansion, um, uh, say express toll lanes as an example for places is also another part of it. Um, there isn't any assumption in our long range plan that we're having pandemic level um, work from home policies continuing into the future. And so that's one of the things. Um, so if the question is around that, we definitely don't have an assumption of a third of our workforce continuing to work from home. So all of these kind of outputs that you're seeing in the plan in 2050 are more reflective of changes in, I'd say, land use and transportation network connectivity combined together. Great. Feel Thank free, you, Ben or Kelly, to add anything I might have missed in that. Um, no, high level. I think that's I think that's it. It has come up that um, questions about um, the, the state, I believe, is beginning some work to look at the commute trip reduction um, program and look at sort of modernizing some of the um, policies and and elements of that program. So it's something that we'll be closely watching, and it would be reflected in our regional plan um, as those changes are made. So an, another question has to do with um, maybe a high growth area in P East Pierce County. So the Tahale development in East Pierce County will be a um, population of 30,000 when completed, and that's expected in about 2035. Um, residents of that area will need transit and will also need some highway improvements to serve that population, as well as the remainder of the folks in, in, the, in the greater East P Pierce County when the primary corridors are already at or beyond capacity. Um, how can we, or I'm assuming, you know, residents of that part of East um, Pierce County get some funding from PSRC to help meet that overwhelming demand. So I'm guessing, Ben, you're looking to me to answer that question. I would. Um, maybe it's, maybe <laughs> it's an answer that has to do with just how projects get into the plan, and um, that's sure. probably the most relevant answer. Yeah, so maybe I'll start with just acknowledging, and, and apologies, I have um, one little screen, and since I'm sharing, I can't go look at um, our website, but we do, as I mentioned, we do have our web map and our visualization tool, and if you go to the forecast conditions, you'll actually be able to, one of the layers you can select are the planned project investments out into the future. And a little note on that is, again, we, we can't track in line item every single project, for example, every, every sidewalk project, every local roadway improvement project. So we set, them set some thresholds and it's those larger scale projects that we track, but you'll be able to zoom into whatever area of the region to see what's going on in terms of future growth, the current system, as well as planned investment. So step one, I would suggest is, um, uh, decision makers, local agency staff, as well as members of the public, you could zoom into that map on your area and see what's happening and see what's already planned. So that's that I would say would be step one. So we take those um, larger investments and they need to be in the regional transportation plan to be anchored in there before we would be able to fund them. But then, as I mentioned, we do uh, federal transportation um, funding competitions every two years and we split our competition, competitions we have competitions specifically for Federal Transit Administration dollars. We have competitions for our highway dollars that focus on larger scale regional places. We call them our designated regional centers. But then each county also has an opportunity to compete. Um, all of the jurisdictions within a county can compete for smaller scale, more localized investments. So there's a, a wide breadth of opportunity to compete for federal transportation dollars from PSRC and it all comes back to supporting our regional policies as outlined in Vision 2050 and the Regional Transportation Plan. So if the local jurisdiction or the transit agency has planned investments for those certain areas, and those planned investments are captured in our long range regional transportation plan, they would then be eligible to compete. It is a competition, so we don't have any kind of quota or formula for, for how, we, how we disperse funds because there's a lot more need than there are funds available, but that would be the process to start with. So I, I would certainly encourage everyone to look at what you're seeing in, in your area, both from our tools, but also your, uh, your local city and, and county to see what's planned and provide that feedback in, in the plan document when you provide public comment. Great. 
Um, there are just two more. There are more comments than questions. So please, we have some time. So if you have any additional questions, um, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, the first one is more of an observation, and it had to do with that the number of housing units um, that might need to locate within high capacity transit areas over the next 28 years. And someone faster than me did some even quicker um, back of the napkin calculations of for housing and station areas. Um, if we were to construct 4,500 new 100 uh, um, apartment or condo buildings in station areas, that's about 160 built buildings per year for 28 years. And so that would meet that 450 roughly thousand number. So um, that's a great way to kind of think of the scale of development that we are anticipating or might need to, to meet that objective. Another has to do, and Kelly, maybe you want to, um, or I can take part of this, but it has to do with the observation that toll roads are great for people that have the means. Um, uh, they have the ability to buy into um, those express toll lanes. Um, everyone else, uh, people without the means, then you know, have, there's some impacts on them. And, and so there's a, um, I think, skepticism of the um, equity of toll roads um, in the plan or, or in these types of plans. One thing I would note, We've done work on different types of road usage charge studies and looking at express toll lanes um, in earlier versions of our plan. And one thing that our policymakers have definitely uh, identified as part of the implementation of any sorts of programs like that is um, an ability to provide some sort of mitigation measures for people of lower means. Maybe those are subsidies, maybe those are uh, lower fares, you can think of systems like the Orca Lift program, uh, which provides a, a, a lower fare price for people of uh, more limited incomes. And so that's definitely recognized and discussed in the plan and as something that we would need to mitigate for. Um, anything to add on that, Kelly? Yeah, the only other thing I would add is that uh, I think it's a really fair point, and it's definitely at top of mind whenever we talk about um, financing and, and pricing certain facilities. But I would say in general, the, the whole point of implementing, for example, an express toll lane isn't just to provide benefit for the folks that are able to pay that toll and be in those lanes. The purpose of putting them in general is to make the entire system work better. I know when you're sitting in that traffic, that might be hard to believe that the overall system is working better with them than without them. But the state of Washington, WashDOT, has done some really interesting studies showing the before and after impact in terms of throughput on all of the lanes of a system with and without something like an express toll lane. So I think that is that is kind of the impetus behind the state or us really thinking about that. It's it's a tool one tool in a, in a big toolbox of, of items to make the full system work better. But there's always, you know, facility by facility, user by user, there, there are gonna be those other considerations such as uh, um, income equity to, to consider that need to be built into that system. And, you know, Craig, I know you have some observations on um, the income levels of folks who are using um, those kind of, maybe that, that have longer commutes and might might use some of those freeway corridors. Anything to add on um, what we're seeing in in that for the express toll lane network? Um, no, I think Kelly answered it really well. I'm not thinking of any, I don't have any numbers off the top of my head specific to the express toll lanes. So I, I don't want to say something that is okay, no, that's inaccurate. Fine. I, so. I'm not remembering something else. So sorry about that. Sorry to put you on the spot. Oh, no problem. Um, there's one last question here, Kelly, and it has to do with, with process and upcoming steps. And so if you could share some more detail about how PSRC staff will use public comments um, and how we'll be bring that to the board. Sure, that's a, that's a great question. So as I mentioned, we've, we've already done a lot of outreach. There's reports on our website that we've also provided to our board of what we heard from the public surveys. We have a fresh report that we'll be sharing on what we heard from the focus groups. Everything you tell us will be presented to our, our boards as part of their decision making process. So we anticipate receiving a lot of comments on the draft plan. And so every month between now and April, we're going to be providing information to the board about what we're hearing. We're going to start with preliminary themes as things are coming in. At the end of the public comment period, we will be providing a full report showing every single comment. We're, we as staff are going to try to um, review all of those and, and collate them so that we can identify the types of comments we're receiving. Are they talking about 
uh, bicycle and pedestrian improvements? Are they talking about transit? Are they talking about safety? So we'll kind of gather them together and share that information to the board. And we'll also identify those that are um, you're either in support or against, or if they have suggestions, if they have corrections that we need to make in the plan. And then there will be some comments where the board will have to identify, are, does the plan need to be revised in some way because of, um, due to these comments? So long story short, every single comment we will review and every single comment will go into a report for board review. And it's, it's up to the board then to uh, determine um, changes to the plan either from, from those comments or some, some cases it's refining our language, some cases we've just um, missed something and we need to correct something and others are going to be substantive policy discussions for the board. Um, ben, you are um, as ingrained if not, uh, if not more than I am on uh, outreach and public comment. Anything to add there? No, I think you, you captured it well. Um, we also publish all of those comments on our website and post letters that we receive. We try to sort um, comments as they're coming in, and they're coming in right now through our website. Um, and Kelly, as we close this out, we'll, we'll again show the ways that we are collecting public comment, but we um, try to be as transparent as possible about the written comment that we receive. Uh, even from forums like this, we'll characterize the, the comments and concerns and issues that are that are raised, and we'll, we'll um, also report that to the board. Um, so we, we really try to be diligent about getting all of those comments into the hands of the board and also into the hands of the public so that um, as decisions are made about the, the final edits to the plan, um, it's clear that that information was provided. As we're getting close to the hour here, there are a couple of, uh, one gets to clarify that the board initially is the transportation policy board that will be considering um, changes to the plan. The executive board also is the official recommending body um, for the plan that is uh, eventually adopted by our general assembly, which is it's it's sort of a complicated mix of boards and levels of decision making, but we have an annual meeting every year. It'll be um, in late May of our general assembly and they'll officially adopt the plan, but that's after a recommendation by both the transportation policy board to the executive board and then the executive board to um, the general assembly. And so maybe one last um, question, Kelly, um, and it's uh, and they're related. There, there are two additional questions about the observation, or at least the opinion, that um, an HOV lane converted to a bus-only lane has higher traffic commute, commuter effects, smaller environmental impact, and greater travel time reliability. And so has there been, and this is kind of a, a, a related question, has there been any exploration of the possibility of changing toll lanes into dedicated separated transit lanes for a true BRT system? Um, that's a great question. To date, we have not received um, comments or direction to go that route, but I know maybe I'll, I'll, we invited Craig so we could put him on the spot. We, we do every once in a while, as I mentioned, PSRC does not um, come up with the project investments, but we come up with the analysis, we come up with the policies, we identify those needs. But we do, we are able to do some scenario testing. And so we have um, done some scenario testing for board information about if you do certain things, how might that change or improve the system? So I guess the short answer, the long answer at this point, since I'm, I'm rambling on a little bit, is that we don't have any um, projects that have been proposed to do so yet, um, but we're always looking at um, how might the system be better improved, and the thing that we can do is do some testing and just provide that information back. I feel like that was somewhat of an unsatisfying answer. So Ben or Craig, what would you add to that? I was just going to add, it's a, a great observation. We ran a sensitivity test. Um, so the, the comments that were made about it increasing capacity, we, we ran a test to see that if all of our um, bus rapid transit routes actually ran in fully dedicated lanes. So one of the ways you could achieve that is based on the comments you made there. And we saw a significant increase in the ridership on those BRT routes. It was more than a 25% increase in ridership. Um, so we, we've definitely tested sensitivities along that. And I really appreciate the, the comment. And that's one of the reasons we have this so we can get feedback like this to share with our decision makers. Thank you, Craig. And so we're at the time, but there is one last question. And I think there's a quick answer, um, Kelly. 
So cities are responsible for um, American, Americans with Disability Act compliance in public rights of way. Um, although these kinds of projects are projected to receive only seven, about 7% 7 of the total regional transportation plan funding are the distributed needs for sidewalks, curb ramps and crosswalks, which may be within a half mile of transit fully accounted for and, and addressed in the allocation approach that is proposed? Uh, I'm not quite, I don't think that that's a quick answer because I'm not quite sure, I think <laughs> a couple of thoughts. So one thing is just to note our, our, as I mentioned earlier, we can't track every local investment. So we are a very large region. We tend to focus on the regional system. And a lot of the investments you're talking about would be more at the local scale. They are captured programmatically in our plan. They're, they are captured from a financial perspective, but not an individual project perspective. So there's some limitations to how, how granular we can go for those types of investments. In terms, so they are captured in the long range financial strategy. In terms of PSRC's funding, they are certainly eligible for, for all of our funding. And we, we, we do include, you know, active transportation and safety and things like that are, are well established in our criteria as well as our uh, overall funding program. So there's some layers there in terms of all of the long range thinking, what we can track, and then just in, just in kind of uh, bare bones terms, the eligibility to receive PSRC's federal dollars. Um, not quite sure how best to answer that other than it's certainly something um, is, and I would point to the coordinated mobility plan that we've talked about under Gene Kim's purview, encourage you to read that because a lot of those types of things that she mentioned ADA and curb ramps, those are certainly strategies and investments that are also highlighted in that part of the plan. Those were the answers. That was the answer I anticipated you'd give Kelly. So I think that was, that was great. So turn it over to you to close this out. Yes, and so I just wanted to make sure since I knew we were getting close to time, I wanted you all to have the um, information on how you can comment. We certainly hope that you do. We really appreciate the, the questions and the, the feedback we've gotten this morning. We shared with you the online open house and you can see the, the email, or excuse me, the, the URL there. There's an online comment form, as I mentioned. You can also email your comment to transportation at psrc.org and you can also mail your comment to our mailing address, uh, which is also on the screen on our website. So with that, we really appreciate your time. We encourage you to, to review the plan and provide comment. And um, we hope you have a great rest of your day. So thank you.